Bulka by Count Lev N. Tolstoy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bulka I had a small bulldog. He was called Bulka. He was black. Only the tips of his front feet were white. All bulldogs have their lower jaws longer than the upper, and the upper teeth come down behind the nether teeth. But Bulka's lower jaw protruded so much that I could put my finger between the two rows of teeth. His face was broad, his eyes large, black, and sparkling, and his teeth and incisors stood out prominently. He was as black as a negro. He was gentle and did not bite, but he was strong and stubborn. If he took hold of a thing, he clenched his teeth and clung to it like a rag, and it was not possible to tear him off, any more than as though he were a lobster. Once he was let loose on a bear, and he got hold of the bear's ear and stuck to him like a leech. The bear struck him with his paws and squeezed him and shook him from side to side but he could not tear himself loose from him and so he fell down on his head in order to crush bulka but bulka held on to him until they poured cold water over him i got him as a puppy and raised him myself when i went to the caucasus i did not want to take him along and so went away from him quietly ordering him to be shut up at the first station i was about to change the relay when suddenly i saw something black and shining coming down the road it was bulka in his brass collar he was flying at full speed toward the station he rushed up to me licked my hand and stretched himself out in the shade under the cart his tongue stuck out a whole hand's length he now drew it in to swallow the spittle and now stuck it out again a whole hand's length. He tried to breathe fast, but could not do so, and his sides just shook. He turned from one side to the other, and struck his tail against the ground. I learned later that after I had left he had broken a pane, jumped out of the window, and followed my track along the road, and thus raced twenty versts through the greatest heat. End of Bulka by Count Lev N. Tolstoy. Read by Nemo. Clara Barton by Mary Stoyell Stimson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clara Barton. It was on the brightest, sunniest kind of a Christmas morning nearly one hundred years ago that Clara Barton was born, in the state of Massachusetts. Besides the parents, there were two grown-up sisters and two big brothers to pet the new baby. There was plenty of love and plenty of money in the Barton household, so the child knew nothing but happiness. Clara was a bright little thing. As she grew old enough to walk and talk, she followed the family about repeating all their words and phrases like a parrot she was not sure as to the meaning of all these words but she liked the sound of them her father who had fought in the french and indian wars had a fondness for the rules and forms that are used among soldiers he taught her the names and rank of army officers also the name of the united states president the vice president and members of the president's cabinet clara's eyes looked so big and her voice was so solemn when she babbled these names that her mother asked her one day what she thought these men looked like oh gasped clara papa always says the great president so i guess he's almost a giant i guess the president is as big as the meeting-house and probably the vice president is the size of the schoolhouse the schoolteacher sisters were busy with clara so that she was reading and spelling almost as soon as she could talk one of these gave her a geography, and Clara was so excited over it that she used to wake this poor sister up long before daylight 
and make her hold a candle close to the maps so that she could find rivers mountains and cities stephen barton the older brother was a wonder in arithmetic it was he who taught clara how to add subtract multiply and divide she made such good figures and so often had the examples right that she enjoyed her little slate next best to riding horseback with her brother david david did not care much for study but did like farm work and horses he taught clara to ride and the two used to gallop across the country at a mad pace she felt as safe on the back of a horse as in a rocking chair she did not look much larger than a doll when the neighbors first noticed her dashing by on the back of a colt which wore neither saddle nor bridle clinging to the animal's mane keeping close to david's horse and laughing with joy sometimes button the white dog tore along after them trying his best to keep up with them button belonged to clara he had taken care of her when she was a baby and very gravely picked her up each time she fell in the days when she was learning to walk stephen and david went to a school that was several miles away they wanted to take clara with them it was one of the old-fashioned ungraded schools and the pupils were all ages the snowdrifts were high and stephen carried clara on his shoulder clara sat very quiet with her slate until the primer class was called then she stepped before the teacher with the other little ones the serious man pointed to the letters of different words for each child then he asked them to spell short words like dog and cat when clara was asked to do the same she smiled at the teacher and said but i do not spell there where do you spell he inquired i spell in artichoke she answered looking very dignified in that case he laughed i think you belong with the scholars who spell in three and four syllables so after that she spelled in the class of her big brothers when clara was twelve she was very shy of strangers and her parents thought it might help her to get over it if she went away from home to school in new york she was a bright pupil and decided she would like to be a teacher like her two sisters clara made an excellent teacher but was not very well and went to washington d c to work while there the civil war broke out and she offered her services as a nurse nobody doubted she would be good at nursing for when she was only ten years old she took all the care of her dear brother david who was sick for nearly two years she really knew just exactly what sick people needed clara worked in hospitals camps and battlefields all the time the four years war lasted sometimes she had to jump onto a horse whose rider had been shot and dash away for bandages or a surgeon and she was glad enough that david had taught her to be such a fine horsewoman clara helped every sick and wounded man she came across and some people thought she should only help the northerners but she did not mind what anybody said or thought she made all the soldiers as comfortable as she could and she was delighted when four years later while she was in beautiful switzerland for a rest she heard of the red cross society this society helped every wounded person no matter what color he was no matter what cause or country he fought for clara barton worked with the swiss society all through the war between france and prussia the foreigners called her the angel when clara barton came back to america she tried a long time to have a branch of the swiss society started in this country but it was eight years before the red cross society was actually formed in america then because there was often sickness and suffering from fires and floods as well as from wars miss barton persuaded congress to say that the society might help wherever there had been any great disaster miss barton's name is known in europe as well as in america she did red cross work until she was eighty years old almost every country on the globe gave her a present or medal when we think what a heroine clara barton proved herself it would seem as if the little girl born on the sunny december morning was a christmas present to the whole world end of clara barton by mary stoyell stimson read by betty b the gray hair by count lev n tolstoy 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gray Hare A gray hare was living in the winter near the village. When night came, he pricked one ear and listened. Then he pricked a second ear, moved his whiskers, sniffed, and sat down on his hind legs. Then he took a leap or two over the deep snow, and again sat down on his hind legs and looked around him. Nothing could be seen but snow. The snow lay in waves and glistened like sugar. Over the hare's head hovered a frost vapor, and through this vapor could be seen the large bright stars. The hare had to cross the highway in order to come to a threshing floor he knew of. On the highway, the runners could be heard squeaking, and the horses snorting, and seats creaking in the sleighs. The hare again stopped near the road. Peasants were walking beside the sleighs, and the collars of their caftans were raised. Their faces were scarcely visible. Their beards, mustaches, and eyelashes were white. Steam rose from their mouths and noses. Their horses were sweaty, and the hoarfrost clung to the sweat. The horses jostled under their arches and dived in and out of snowdrifts. The peasants ran behind the horses and in front of them and beat them with their whips. Two peasants walked beside each other, and one of them told the other how a horse of his had once been stolen. When the carts passed by, the hare leaped across the road and softly made for the threshing floor. A dog saw the hare from a cart. He began to bark and darted after the hare. The hare leaped toward the threshing floor over the snowdrifts, which held him back, but the dog stuck fast in the snow after the tenth leap and stopped. Then the hare too stopped and sat up on his hind legs, and then softly went on to the threshing floor. On his way, he met two other hares on the sowed winter field. They were feeding and playing. The hare played a while with his companions, dug away the frosty snow with them, ate the winter green, and went on. In the village, everything was quiet. The fires were out. All one could hear was a baby's cry in a hut, and the crackling of the frost in the logs of the cabins. The hare went to the threshing floor, and there found some companions. He played a while with them on the cleared floor, ate some oats from the open granary, climbed on the kiln over the snow-covered roof, and across the wicker fence started back to his ravine. The dawn was glimmering in the east. The stars grew less, and the frost vapors rose more densely from the earth. In the nearby village, the women got up and went to fetch water. The peasants brought the feed from the barn. The children shouted and cried. There were still more carts going down the road, and the peasants talked aloud to each other. The hare leaped across the road, went up to his old lair, picked out a high place, dug away the snow, lay with his back in his new lair, dropped his ears on his back, and fell asleep with open eyes. End of the Gray Hair by Count Lev and Tolstoy Read by Nemo Hans in Luck from Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigand this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns Hans had served his master for seven years, when he one day said to him, Master, my time is up. I want to go home to my mother. Please give me my wages. His master answered, you have served me well and faithfully, and as the service has been, so shall the wages be. 
and he gave him a lump of gold as big as his head. Hans took out his pocket handkerchief and tied up the gold in it, and then slung the bundle over his shoulder and started on his homeward journey. As he walked along, just putting one foot before the other, a man on horseback appeared, riding gaily and merrily along on his capering steed. Ah, said Hans, quite loud as he passed, what a fine thing riding must be. You are as comfortable as if you were in an armchair. You don't stumble over any stones. You save your shoes, and you get over the road you hardly know how. The horseman, who heard him, stopped and said, Hello, Hans. Why are you on foot? I can't help myself, said Hans, for I have this bundle to carry home. It is true that it is a lump of gold, but I can hardly hold my head up for it, and it weighs down my shoulder frightfully. I'll tell you what, said the horseman. We will change. I will give you my horse, and you shall give me your bundle. With all my heart, said Hans, but you will be rarely weighted down with it. The horseman dismounted, took the gold, and helped Hans up, put the bridle into his hands, and said, When you want to go very fast, you must click your tongue and cry, Gip, Gip. Hans was delighted when he found himself so easily riding along on horseback. After a time, it occurred to him that he might be going faster, and he began to click with his tongue and cry, Gip, Gip. The horse broke into a gallop, and before Hans knew where he was, he was thrown off into a ditch which separated the fields from the high road. The horse would have run away if a peasant coming along the road leading a cow had not caught it. Hans felt himself all over and picked himself up, but he was very angry, and he said to the peasant, Riding is poor fun at times, when you have a nag like mine, which stumbles and throws you, and puts you in danger of breaking your neck. I will never mount it again. I think much more of your cow there. You can walk comfortably behind her, and you have her milk into the bargain every day, as well as butter and cheese. What I would not give for a cow like that. Well, said the peasant, if you have such a fancy for it as all that, I will exchange the cow for the horse. Hans accepted the offer with delight, and the peasant mounted the horse and rode happily off. Hans drove his cow peacefully on and thought what a lucky bargain he had made. If only I have a bit of bread, and I don't expect ever to be without it, I shall always have butter and cheese to eat with it. If I'm thirsty, I only have to milk my cow and I have milk to drink. My heart, what more can you desire? When he came to an inn, he made a halt, and in his great joy, he ate up all the food he had with him, all his dinner and his supper, and he gave the last coins he had for half a glass of beer. Then he went on farther in the direction of his mother's village, driving the cow before him. The heat was very oppressive, and as midday drew near, Hans found himself on a heath, which it took him an hour to cross. He was so hot and thirsty that his tongue was parched and clung to the roof of his mouth. This can easily be set to rights, thought Hans. I will milk my cow and sup up the milk. He tied her to a tree, and as he had no pail, he used his leather cap instead. But, try as hard as he liked, not a single drop of milk appeared. As he was very clumsy in his attempts, the impatient animal gave him a severe kick on his forehead with one of her hind legs. He was stunned by the blow and fell to the ground where he lay for some time, not knowing where he was. Happily, just then a butcher came along the road, trundling a young pig in a wheelbarrow. What is going on here? he cried, 
as he helped poor Hans up. Hans told him all that had happened. The butcher handed him his flask and said, Here, take a drink. It will do you good. The cow can't give any milk, I suppose. She must be too old, and good for nothing but to be a beast of burden, or go to the butcher. Oh, dear, said Hans, smoothing his hair. Now who would ever have thought it? Killing the animal's all very well, but what kind of meat will it be? For my part, I don't like cow's flesh. It's not juicy enough. Now, if one had a nice young pig like that, it would taste ever so much better. And then, all the sausages. Listen, Hans, said the butcher. For your sake, I will exchange and let you have the pig instead of the cow. God reward your friendship, said Hans, handing over the cow as the butcher untied the pig and put the halter with which it was tied into his hand. Hans went on his way, thinking how well everything was turning out for him. Even if a mishap befell him, something else immediately happened to make up for it. Soon after this, he met a lad carrying a beautiful white goose under his arm. They passed the time of day, and Hans began to tell him how lucky he was and what successful bargains he had made. The lad told him that he was taking the goose for a christening feast. Just feel it, he went on, holding it up by the wings. Feel how heavy it is. It's true they have been stuffing it for eight weeks. Whoever eats that roast goose will have to wipe the fat off both sides of his mouth. Yes, indeed, answered Hans, weighing it in his hand. But my pig is no lightweight either. Then the lad looked cautiously from side to side, shook his head. Now look here, he began. I don't think it's all quite straight about your pig. One has just been stolen out of Schultz's sty in the village I have come from. I fear it is the one you're leading. They have sent people out to look for it, and it would be a bad business for you if you were found with it. The least they would do would be to put you in the black hole. Poor Hans was very much frightened at this. Oh, dear, he said. Do help me out of this trouble. You are more at home here. Take my pig and let me have your goose. Well, I shall run some risk if I do, but I won't be the means of getting you into a scrape. So he took the rope in his hand and quickly drove the pig up a side road. And honest Hans, relieved of his trouble, plodded on with the goose under his arm. When I really come to think it over, he said to himself, I have still had the best of the bargain. First... There is the delicious roast goose, and then all the fat that will drip out of it in cooking will keep us in goose fat to eat on our bread for three months at least. And, last of all, there are the beautiful white feathers, which I will stuff my pillow with, and then I shall need no rocking to send me to sleep. How delighted my mother will be! As he passed through the last village, he came to a knife grinder with his cart, singing to his wheel as it buzzed merrily round. Scissors and knives I grind so fast And hang up my cloak against the blast. Hans stopped to look at him, and at last he spoke to him and said, You must be doing a good trade to be so merry over your grinding. Yes, answered the grinder, the work of one's hands has a golden foundation. A good grinder finds money wherever he puts his hand into his pocket. But where did you buy that beautiful goose? I didn't buy it. I exchanged my pig for it. And the pig? Oh, I got that instead of my cow. And the cow? I got that for a horse. And the horse? I gave a lump of gold as big as my head for it. And the gold? Oh, 
That was my wages for seven years' service. You certainly have known how to manage your affairs, said the grinder. Now, if you could manage to hear the money jingling in your pockets when you got up in the morning, you would indeed have made a fortune. How shall I set about that? asked Hans. You must be a grinder like me. Nothing is needed for it but a whetstone. Everything else will come of itself. I have one here which certainly is a little damaged, but you need not give me anything for it but your goose. Are you willing? How can you ask me such a question? said Hans. Why, I shall be the happiest person in the world. If I can save some money every time I put my hand in my pocket, what more should I have to trouble about? So he handed him the goose and took the whetstone in exchange. Now, said the grinder, lifting up an ordinary large stone which lay near the road, here is another good stone into the bargain. You can hammer out all your old nails on it to straighten them. Take it and carry it off. Hans shouldered the stone and went on his way with a light heart and his eyes shining with joy. I must have been born in a lucky hour, he cried. Everything happens just as I want it and as it would happen to a Sunday's child. In the meantime, as he had been on foot since daybreak, he began to feel very tired, and he was also very hungry, as he had eaten all his provisions at once in his joy at his bargain over the cow. At last, he could hardly walk any farther, and he was obliged to stop every minute to rest. Then the stones were frightfully heavy and he could not get rid of the thought that it would be very nice if he were not obliged to carry them any farther. He dragged himself like a snail to a well in the fields, meaning to rest and refresh himself with a draught of the cool water. So, as not to injure the stones by sitting on them, he laid them carefully on the edge of the well. Then he sat down, and was about to stoop down to drink when he inadvertently gave them a little push, and both stones fell straight into the water. When Hans saw them disappear before his very eyes, he jumped for joy, and then knelt down and thanked God with tears in his eyes for having shown him this further grace and relieved him of the heavy stones, which were all that remained to trouble him, without giving him anything to reproach himself with. There is certainly no one under the sun so happy as I, he said. And so, with a light heart, free from every care, he bounded on home to his mother. End of Hunts in Luck by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigand Recording by T.J. Burns Honoring Parents by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org I suppose all my young readers have learned the fifth commandment and have often been told that children should honor their parents by cheerful and prompt obedience to all their commands. This is one way in which parents should be honored continually. But there is another way by which you may not only show that you feel respect for your father and mother yourself, but you may force others to feel the same respect for them. That you may understand what I mean. I will tell you a story of a little boy who for once at least in his life honored his mother. This was not by any command, however, for she not with him at the time, and I do not suppose that she ever heard of the circumstance which I am about to tell you. One morning, a teacher entered her school of about sixty children, accompanied by another young lady, her friend. 
the children did not cluster around as thickly as usual. Some quietly took their seats, and others, disliking the restraint of a stranger's presence, ran into the playground. But nine o'clock soon came, and the teacher, having conducted her friend to a seat where she might observe what passed around her, rang a small bell, and the seats were soon filled with rosy cheeks and smiling countenances. The morning hymn was sung, and then all knelt to implore the blessing of him who loved little children when he was in the world, and who loves them no less now he is in heaven. They rose from their knees, and soon the teacher was besieged with classes and the children who could study with their books. Miss H., the stranger, soon became interested in watching the movement of six or eight little boys of four years old, who occupied a low bench near her. The smallest of these was a little black-eyed boy who moved about on the seat as much as anyone and made rather more than his share of noise. He had a little book of pictures which he was eagerly displaying to the little ones around him and several times had his earnest explanations been interrupted by the voice of the teacher saying, Willie, my dear, you must look at the pictures without talking, when a rude boy stepped up and snatched it from his hand. Now, what would you have done if you had been in Willie's place just then? Would you have struck your naughty little playmate or called him bad names? Or should you have tried to snatch the book back again? Willie knew a better way. He looked troubled indeed at first. He asked for the book in a very coaxing tone, but when he found that the selfish Henry would not give it up, he quietly turned away to find amusement in something else. A little girl who sat near now handed Willie a large yellow-covered book full of beautiful painted pictures. His eyes now sparkled more brightly than ever as he began to turn over the leaves. Soon, Henry spied the pretty book, and not at all ashamed of his unkindness, he moved towards Willie and began to look over his shoulder. Would you not have punished him away, or at least have turned round so as to conceal the book? But Willie held it towards him, and pointed to the bright pictures as pleasantly as if Henry had never been unkind to him. When school had closed and the children had left the room, Miss H. said to the teacher, Who is that little boy who called Willie? His name is William D., said the teacher. But why do you wish to know? Because I know he has a good mother, was the reply. Now. How did the stranger, who never spoke to the little boy in her life, know that he had a good mother? Was it not by his kind and forgiving conduct to Henry? Yes, she knew that some good mother had taught little Willie not to return evil for evil, but to do good to those that used him spitefully. It was true. Willie's mother loved the meek and forgiving Savoyer and tried to teach her little boy to love him and be like him. And was she not honoured when the conduct of her son told everyone that he had a good mother? Dear children, can you not thus honour your parents? But instead of this, some children take the opportunity when they are away from their parents to disobey all their wishes and instructions and thus lead those who see them to suppose that they have not been taught to do right. Oh, how dreadful that the conduct of a child should cause a stranger to say, I know he has a bad mother. End of Honoring Parents by Anonymous Louisa May Alcott by Mary Stoyell Stimson. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. louisa may alcott as much as seventy years ago in the city of boston there lived a small girl who had the naughty habit of running away on a certain april morning almost as soon as her mother finished buttoning her dress louisa may alcott slipped out of the house and up the street as fast as her feet could carry her louisa crept through a narrow alley and crossed several streets it was a beautiful day and she did not care so very much just where she went so long as she was having an adventure all by herself suddenly she came upon some children who said they were going to a nice tall ash heap to play they asked her to join them louisa thought they were fine playmates for when she grew hungry they shared some cold potatoes and bread crusts with her she would not have thought this much of a lunch in her mother's dining room but for an outdoor picnic it did very well when she tired of the ash heap she bade the children good-bye thanked them for their kindness and hop skipped to the common where she must have wandered about for hours because all of a sudden it began to grow dark then she wanted to get home she wanted her doll her kitty and her mother it frightened her when she could not find any street that looked natural she was hungry and tired too she threw herself down on some doorsteps to rest and to watch the lamplighter for you must remember this was long before there was any gas or electricity in boston at this moment a big dog came along he kissed her face and hands and then sat down beside her with a sober look in his eyes as if he were thinking i guess little girl you need someone to take care of you poor tired louisa leaned against his neck and was fast asleep in no time the dog kept very still he did not want to wake her pretty soon the town crier went by he was ringing a bell and reading in a loud voice from a paper in his hand the description of a lost child you see louisa's father and mother had missed her early in the forenoon and had looked for her in every place they could think of each hour they grew more worried and at dusk they decided to hire this man to search the city when the runaway woke up and heard what the man was shouting lost lost a little girl six years old in a pink frock white hat and new green shoes she called out in the darkness why dat's me the town crier took louisa by the hand and led her home where you may be sure she was welcomed with joy mr and mrs alcott from first to last had had a good many frights about this flyaway louisa once when she was only two years old they were travelling with her on a steamboat and she darted away in some moment when no one was noticing her and crawled into the engine room to watch the machinery of course her clothes were all grease and dirt and she might have been caught in the machinery and hurt you won't be surprised to know that the next day after this last affair louisa's parents made sure that she did not leave the house indeed to be entirely certain of her whereabouts they tied her to the leg of a big sofa for a whole day except for this one fault louisa was a good child so she felt much ashamed that she had caused her mother whom she loved dearly so much worry as she sat there tied to the sofa she made up her mind that she would never frighten her so again no she would cure herself of the running away habit after that day whenever she felt the least desire to slip out of the house without asking permission she would hurry to her own little room and shut the door tight to keep her mind from bad plans she would shut her eyes and make up stories think them all out herself you know then when some of them seemed pretty good she would write them down so that she would not forget them by and by she found she liked making stories better than anything she had ever done in her life her mother sometimes wondered why louisa grew so fond of staying in her little chamber at the head of the stairs all of a sudden but was pleased that the runaway child had changed into such a quiet like to stay at home girl it was a long time before louisa dared to mention the stories and rhymes she had hidden in her desk but finally she told her mother about them and when mrs alcott had read them she advised her to keep on writing louisa did so and became one of the best american story-tellers 
she wrote a number of books and if you begin with lulu's library you will want to read little men and little women and all the books that dear louisa alcott ever wrote at first louisa was paid but small sums for her writings and as the alcott family were poor she taught school did sewing took care of children or worked at anything always with a merry smile so long as it provided comforts for those she loved when the civil war broke out she was anxious to do something to help so she went into one of the union hospitals as a nurse she worked so hard that she grew very ill and her father had to go after her and bring her home one of her books tells about her life in the hospital it was soon after her return home that her books began to sell so well that she found herself for the first time in her life with a great deal of money there was enough to buy luxuries for the alcott family there was enough for her to travel no doubt she got more happiness in travelling than some people for she found boys and girls in england france and germany reading the very books she herself louisa may alcott had written then too at the age of fifty she enjoyed venturing into new places just as well as she did the morning she sallied forth to boston common in her new green shoes end of louisa may alcott by mary storyell stimson read by betty b the tale of mr jeremy fisher by beatrix potter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher Once upon a time there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He lived in a little damp house amongst the buttercups at the edge of a pond. The water was all slippy-sloppy in the larder and in the back passage. But Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet. Nobody ever scolded him, and he never caught a cold. He was quite pleased when he looked out and saw large drops of rain splashing in the pond. I will get some worms and go fishing, and catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends, Mr. Alderman, Ptolemy, Tortoise, and Sir Isaac Newton. The alderman, however, eats salad. Mr. Jeremy put on a Macintosh and a pair of shiny galoshes. He took his rod and basket and set off with enormous hops to the place where he kept his boat. The boat was round and green, and very like the other lily leaves. It was tied to a water plant in the middle of the pond. Mr. Jeremy took a reed pole and pushed the boat out into open water. I know a good place for minnows, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Mr. Jeremy stuck his pole into the mud and fastened the boat to it. Then he settled himself cross-legged and arranged his fishing tackle. He had the dearest little red float. His rod was a tough stalk of grass. His line was a fine long white horse hair, and he tied a little wriggling worm at the end. The rain trickled down his back, and for nearly an hour he stared at the float. This is getting tiresome. I think I should like some lunch, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He punted back again amongst the water plants and took some lunch out of his basket. I will eat a butterfly sandwich and wait till the shower is over, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. A great big water beetle came up underneath the lily leaf and tweaked the toe of one of his galoshes. Mr. Jeremy crossed his legs up shorter, out of reach, and went on eating his sandwich. Once or twice something moved about, with a rustle and a splash amongst the rushes at the side of the pond. I trust that is not a rat, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I think I had better get away from here. Mr. Jeremy shoved the boat out again a little way and dropped in the bait. There was a bite almost directly. The float gave a tremendous bobbit. A minnow, a minnow, I have him by the nose, cried Mr. Jeremy Fisher, jerking up his rod. But what a horrible surprise. Instead of a smooth, fat minnow, Mr. Jeremy landed little Jack Sharp, the stickleback, covered with spines. The stickleback floundered about the boat, pricking and snapping, until he was quite out of breath. Then he jumped back into the water. A shoal of other little fishes put their heads out and laughed at Mr. Jeremy Fisher. And while Mr. Jeremy sat disconsolately on the edge of his boat, sucking his sore fingers and peering down into the water, a much worse thing happened. 
a really frightful thing it would have been if mr jeremy had not been wearing a mackintosh a great big enormous trout came up kerpleflop with a splash and it seized mr jeremy with a snap ow 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 and then it turned and dived down to the bottom of the pond but the trout was so displeased with the taste of the mackintosh that in less than half a minute it spat him out again and the only thing it swallowed was mr jeremy's galoshes mr jeremy bounced up to the surface of the water like a cork and the bubbles out of a soda water bottle and he swam with all his might to the edge of the pond he scrambled out on the first bank he came to and he hopped home across the meadow with his mackintosh all in tatters what a mercy that was naughty pike said mr jeremy fisher i have lost my rod and basket but it does not much matter for i am sure i should never have dared to go fishing again he put some sticking plaster on his fingers and his friends both came to dinner he could not offer them fish but he had something else in his larder sir isaac newton wore his black and gold waistcoat and mr alderman ptolemy tortoise brought a salad with him in a string bag and instead of a nice dish of minnows they had a roasted grasshopper with ladybird sauce which frogs consider a beautiful treat, but I think it must have been nasty. End of the Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher By Beatrix Potter Read by April 6090, California, United States of America One April Day by Mr. M. H. Spielman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One April Day, Part 1, A Queer Godmother It was the first of April. The weather could not make up its mind whether to be tearful or gay. So after changing three times, and deciding at last that it was not grown up to cry, the sun dried up the teardrops, and beamed down on everything and everybody. Isn't it a shame, Wilfred? to have to prepare lessons when it's such a fine afternoon exclaimed nora she rose from the study table and looked longingly out of the french window to where the crocuses on the lawn seemed to be having the best of it don't be lazy replied her brother just come and help me with this sum when i tell you i'm not going to do as you tell me if you were grown up say fifteen it would be different but you're only a year older than me not even nine yet and yet you hallo interrupted wilfred with a low whistle as he strolled towards the window look at that legs which inquired nora gazing in the direction he pointed thems what she asked eagerly looking around none well you are an april fool exclaimed wilfred with scornful glee as he resumed his seat that's the second time to-day and you're a very rude boy and you're not allowed to call me horrid names like that said nora with dignity and i won't be teased always with a very offended look she set to work on her copy-book lend me your paint-box when we've finished our lessons will you nora dear said wilfred after a short pause i can't she replied without looking up why i don't know why but i can't cat in the manger you've got nothing you want to paint as i have there was a longer pause during which they both scribbled away and scratched and spluttered whilst their tongues moved silently from side to side outside their parted lips left to right following the direction of each new line the nora heaved a sigh and remarked wilfred isn't cinderella lovely yes as girls go oh how i wish we lived in those times when there were fairy godmothers and things exclaimed nora rapturously and then she added with a sigh aunt lenora is my godmother but she never gives me anything and the godmothers in the fairy stories always give heaps of things you can't expect great fat podges like that to be like fairy godmothers you silly but she ought to like giving things how nice it is to give presents and be thanked yep it's nice to give presents when they are cheap perhaps continued her brother in a wise voice perhaps aunt lenora can't afford it if she isn't rich cinderella's godmother never seemed to consider the price of anything i wish oh how i wish oh how i wish you'd be quiet and help me with this sum you remember your tables better than i do but you needn't be jolly cocky about it all the same nora wasn't listening to him her mind was far away from lessons 
she was thinking if she had her choice what she would like to be what she would like to do and eat and above all what she would like to wear if only i had a fairy godmother i rubbish exclaimed wilfrid growing cross and frowning as he watched her moving restlessly about the room i of course i wouldn't refuse her anything fairy godmothers generally appear at first disguised as old women and ask for something such as a drink of water or beg you to carry a load of wood or whatever they happen to have in hand so i should be ready to do anything and give anything and earn my big reward oh shrub growled her brother much better lend me your paint box but she didn't hear him taken up with her fancies she continued excitedly i know what i'll do i'll try and tempt her to come perhaps i may even have a fairy godmother without knowing it and she began to dance about singing tra la la fairy godmother come to me now i pray visit a little girl who is longing for you and will do anything you want tra la la fairy godmother come it wasn't very good poetry but nora hadn't time to polish it up oh i say how can i do my lessons with all this going on exclaimed wilfrid and flinging his things together he bounced out of the room and banged the door behind him nora wasn't sorry he was gone and danced once more all around the room singing then knelt down and stretching out her arms toward the crocuses which were so stiff and upright in their indifference she said plaintively come dear fairy godmother i want you and lo between nora and the windows there suddenly appeared a little old woman in a long cloak whose features were hidden by the large hood she wore oh exclaimed nora almost breathless in her astonishment and delight i have come said the stranger in cracked wavering tones i am so glad to see you replied nora politely too excited to feel shy i your fairy godmother am here to test you and see if you are really worthy see this slate which i have brought under my cloak every little lady should be able to do arithmetic right can you do this sum how funny godmother dear said nora looking at it we were just learning these it's a difficult one but i'll try in a few moments she had done the sum and proved it correct very good said the fairy with a grunt of satisfaction will you take a drink of water now asked the hospitable nora eagerly do no thank you but i may take something else tell me what of all your treasures do you like most oh my paint box i knew it i'm glad you tell the truth how do you know it asked nora in surprise i am your fairy godmother i'll take that paint box please nora brought it and gave it to her with the greatest pleasure and pressingly inquired if she might carry anything anywhere but that was not required then she stood waiting expectantly and her heart seemed to turn a somersault of delight when her fairy godmother spoke the following words i am satisfied now you may wish for whatever you like but you must make up your mind before i count three nora's eyes had followed her glance at the clock which pointed to one minute to three but her mind from the flutter of excitement she was in became a complete blank one said the fairy solemnly this brought the little goddaughter to her senses and she began to mutter confusedly shall i wish for a gold carriage like cinderella's or a pet lamb with a blue ribbon and a bell round its neck or a frock embroidered in diamonds or two said the fairy no murmured nora hurriedly if i were a queen i could order those things and everything else i wish the clock struck three i were a three called out the fairy a queen screamed nora just the second after too late said the fairy farewell and she moved towards the door nora's eyes filled with tears please come back she pleaded i can't oh why can't you i don't know why but i can't replied the little old woman this sounded strangely in nora's ears and what sounded stranger still were the next words she heard uttered these were simply thanks awfully then nora exclaimed at once that's wilfred's voice she pushed aside the hood why you're wilfred she cried amazed and you're april billy he shouted with glee throwing off the long cloak you said you'd do anything and give anything for a reward and now you've had to do so without one and bursting out laughing he ran off with the sum and the paint box nora sat down on a footstool and burst out crying she was angry and disappointed and she sobbed bitterly as she thought how she had been tricked into doing wilfrid's horrid sum how she had been made to give away her treasured paint-box which she had envied for months and worst of all a thousand times how she had no fairy godmother after all part two
the little flower girl but nora was a plucky little girl and at times a wise little girl and moreover she had a sort of feeling that it all served her right for being silly and dissatisfied and too selfish to lend her paint box wilfred certainly was a tease but he was really a dear good brother and always lent her his things and did his best to champion her and get her out of a scrape still she felt she would like to pay him out all the same he'd had such a lovely time being fairy godmother so she decided like the weather that it was not grown up to cry and she dried her eyes then all at once she smiled and laughed outright for an idea had come to her which she proceeded to carry out she certainly began to do some rather queer things first of all she took off her shoes and stockings then she untied the pink ribbon which kept her hair tidy so that her curls fell in a tousled mass about her flushed cheeks next she took off her pink overall pinafore which she hid away and gathering her white frock over her head displayed a short red and white striped petticoat running quickly about the room she took all the violets from the vases strewed some of them in the fold of her frock which she held together in one hand and put together a large bunch of the flowers for her other hand then she stepped through the open window threw some sand upon her feet and ankles and thus prepared stood on the path outside looked in and waited very soon wilfred burst into the room exclaiming come and look at the healthy color i've painted on your big doll's pale cheeks oh nora he added looking round the empty room and now he became conscious of a little flower girl standing on the garden path and piteously offering him a bunch of violets nora had heard what he had said and felt vexed that he had dared to touch her big doll still she had not the affection for that stately lady that she had for the small invalid doll with the broken leg so she only said buy a bunch of violets sir he was a tender-hearted boy and at once fetched down his money box from a shelf in the cupboard unlocked it and took out two pence which he gave her but then he felt awkward and refused the flowers an organ in the street started playing i can dance to that if you pay said the little girl thoughtfully eyeing the money box how much do you want he asked three shillings she replied boldly that's all i've got that'll do then she said i want it so badly yes but not heeding his protest she stole into the room and began to dance to the organ as she had seen the poor children do in the streets her little bare feet twirling up slowly and descending with measured steps on to the soft carpet oh i say soon exclaimed wilfred with dissatisfaction my sister nora can dance better than that for nothing nevertheless he felt bound to empty his money-box into the hand she now held out solemnly she made him a little bob of a curtsey then she began to caper about the room in a very different sort of spirit and then catching hold of the astonished boy round the neck she kissed him hi hey, sure up cried wilford disengaging himself and looking sheepish oh you april goose sang nora april goose you're an april goose master wilfred and she uncovered her head and shook back her curls Halloa! exclaimed wilfred ruefully at first and then more cheerily ha do you think i didn't know you all the time did you really inquired his sister her eyes wide open with surprise no i didn't he replied curtly then nora's arm stole round her brother's neck and she put the money into his pocket and told him gently that she had only wanted to have a little bit of fun and he was welcome to use her paint box only please not on her dolls then wilfred told her that she was a jolly good sort and that after all it was a shame to tease her as she couldn't fight him for it and nora hugged him and they both laughed and about how well they had pretended to one another the sun was shining still and when the children romped on the lawn the stuck-up crocuses didn't have the best of it after all end of one april day by mr m h spielman read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america The Snail and the Rose Tree by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A hedge of hazelnut bushes encircled the garden. Without was field and meadow, with cows and sheep. But in the center of the garden stood a rose tree and under it sat a snail. She had much within her, 
she had herself. "'Wait until my time comes,' said she. "'I shall accomplish something more than putting forth roses, "'bearing nuts or giving milk, like the cows and sheep.' "'I expect something fearfully grand,' said the rose-tree. "'May I ask when it will take place?' "'I shall take my time,' said the snail. "'You are in too great a hurry. "'And when this is the case, how can one's expectations be fulfilled?' The next year the snail lay in about the same spot under the rose-tree, which put forth buds and developed roses, ever fresh, ever new. The snail half crept forth, stretched out its feelers, and drew itself in again. Everything looks as it did a year ago. No progress has been made. The rose-tree still bears roses. It does not get along any farther. The summer faded away, the autumn passed, the rose-tree constantly bore flowers and buds, until the snow fell, and the weather was raw and damp. The rose-tree bent itself towards the earth, the snail crept in the earth. A new year commenced. The roses came out, and the snail came out. "'Now you are an old rose-bush,' said the snail. "'You will soon die away.' You have given the world everything that you had in you. Whether that be much or little is a question upon which I have not time to reflect. But it is quite evident that you have not done the slightest thing towards your inner development. Otherwise, I suppose that something different would have sprung from you. Can you answer this? You will soon be nothing but a stick. Can you understand what I say? You startle me, said the rose-tree. I have never thought upon that. No, I suppose that you have never meddled much with thinking. Can you tell me why you blossom, and how it comes to pass? How? Why? No, said the rose-tree. I blossom with pleasure, because I could not do otherwise. The sun was so warm, the air so refreshing. I drank the clear dew and the fortifying rain. I breathed. I lived. A strength came to me from the earth. A strength came from above. I felt a happiness, ever new, ever great, and therefore I must blossom ever. That was my life. I could not do otherwise. You have led a very easy life, said the snail. Certainly everything has been given to me, said the rose-tree, but still more has been given to you. You are one of those meditative, pensive, profound natures, one of the highly gifted, that astound the whole world. I have assuredly no such thought in my mind, said the snail. The world is nothing to me. What have I to do with the world? I have enough with myself and enough in myself. But should we not all here on earth give the best part of us to others, offer what we can? It is true that I have only given roses. But you, you who have received so much, what have you given to the world? What do you give her? What I have given? What I give? I spit upon her. She is good for nothing. I have naught to do with her. Put forth roses you can do no more. Let the hazel bushes bear nuts. Let the cows and sheep give milk. They have each their public. I have mine within myself. I retire within myself, and there I remain. The world is nothing to me. And thereupon the snail withdrew into her house and closed it. That is so sad, said the rose-tree. With the best will I cannot creep in. I must ever spring out, spring forth in roses. The leaves drop off and are blown away by the wind. Yet I saw one of the roses laid in the hymn-book of the mother of the family. One of my roses was placed upon the breast of a charming young girl and one was kissed with joy by a child's mouth. This did me so much good, it was a real blessing. That is my recollection, my life. And the rose-tree flowered in innocence, and the snail sat indifferently in her house. The world was nothing to her. And years passed away. The snail became earth to earth, and the rose-tree became earth to earth. The remembrances in the hymn-book were also blown away. But new rose-trees bloomed in the garden. New snails grew in the garden. They crept in their houses and spat. The world is nothing to them. 
Shall we read the story of the past again? It will not be different. End of the Snail and the Rose Tree by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Sarah Brown The Ant and the Dove by Count Lieb and Tolstoy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ant and the Dove An ant came down from the brook. He wanted a drink. A wave washed him down and almost drowned him. A dove was carrying a branch. She saw that the ant was drowning, so she cast the branch down to him in the brook. The ant got up on the branch and was saved. Then a hunter placed a snare for the dove. It was on the point of drawing it in. The ant crawled up the hunter and bit him on the leg. The hunter groaned and dropped the snare. The dove fluttered upwards and flew away. This recording is in the public domain. The Leapfrog by Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Leapfrog A flea, a grasshopper, and a leapfrog once wanted to see which could jump highest, and they invited the whole world, and everybody else besides, who chose to come to see the festival three famous jumpers were they as every one would say when they all met together in the room i will give my daughter to him who jumps highest exclaimed the king for it is not so amusing when there is no prize to jump for the flea was the first to step forward he had exquisite manners and bowed to the company on all sides for he had noble blood and was moreover accustomed to the society of man alone and that makes a great difference then came the grasshopper he was considerably heavier but he was well mannered and wore a green uniform which he had by right of birth he said moreover that he belonged to a very ancient egyptian family and that in the house where he then was he was thought much of the fact was he had been just brought out of the fields and put in a pasteboard house three stories high all made of court cards with the coloured side inwards and doors and windows cut out of the body of the queen of hearts i sing so well said he that sixteen native grasshoppers who have chirped from infancy and yet got no house built of cards to live in grew thinner than they were before for sheer vexation when they heard me it was thus that the flea and the grasshopper gave an account of themselves and thought they were quite good enough to marry a princess the leapfrog said nothing but people gave it as their opinion that he therefore thought the more and when the house dog snuffed at him with his nose he confessed the leapfrog was of good family the old counsellor who had had three orders given him to make him hold his tongue asserted that the leapfrog was a prophet for that one could see on his back if there would be a severe or mild winter and that was what one could not see even on the back of the man who writes the almanac i say nothing it is true exclaimed the king but i have my own opinion notwithstanding now the trial was to take place the flea jumped so high that nobody could see where he went to so they all asserted he had not jumped at all and that was dishonourable the grasshopper jumped only half as high but he leaped into the king's face who said that was ill-mannered the leapfrog stood still for a long time lost in thought it was believed at last he would not jump at all i only hope he is not unwell said the house dog when pop he made a jump all on one side into the lap of the princess who was sitting on a little golden stool close by hereupon the king said there is nothing above my daughter therefore to bound up to her is the highest jump that can be made but for this one must possess understanding and the leapfrog has shown that he has understanding he is brave and intellectual and so he won the princess it's all the same to me said the flea she may have the old leapfrog for all i care 
i jumped the highest but in this world merit seldom meets its reward a fine exterior is what people look at nowadays the flea then went into foreign service where it is said he was killed the grasshopper sat without on a green bank and reflected on worldly things and he said too yes a fine exterior is everything a fine exterior is what people care about and then he began chirping his peculiar melancholy song from which we have taken this history and which may very possibly be all untrue although it does stand here printed in black and white end of the leapfrog by hans christian anderson the mouse under the granary by count lev and tolstoy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the mouse under the granary a mouse was living under the granary in the floor of the granary was a little hole and the grain fell down through it the mouse had an easy life of it but she wanted to brag of her ease she gnawed a larger hole in the floor and invited other mice come to a feast with me said she there will be plenty to eat for everybody when she brought the mice she saw there was no hole the peasant had noticed the big hole in the floor and had stopped it up this recording is in the public domain the old man and death by count lev and tolstoy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the old man and death an old man cut some wood which he carried away he had to carry it far he grew tired so he put down his bundle and said oh if death would only come death came and said here i am what do you want the old man was frightened and said lift up my bundle this recording is in the public domain the stag and the fawn by count lieb and tolstoy this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Father, you are larger and fleeter than the dogs, and, besides, you have huge antlers for defense. Why, then, are you so afraid of the dogs? The stag laughed and said, you speak the truth my child the trouble is the moment i hear the dogs bark i run before i have time to think end of the stag and the fawn by count lib and tolstoy read by h z ferrara the turtle by count lev n Tolstoy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Turtle. Once I went with Milton to the chase. Near the forest he began to search. He straightened out his tail, pricked his ears, and began to sniff. I fixed the gun and fouled him. I thought that he was looking for a partridge, hare, or pheasant. But Milton did not make for the forest, but for the field. I followed him and looked ahead of me. Suddenly I saw what he was searching for. In front of him was running a small turtle, of the size of a cap. Its bare, dark gray head on a long neck was stretched out like a pestle. The turtle in walking stretched its bare legs far out, and its back was all covered with bark. When it saw the dog, it hid its legs and head 
and let itself down on the grass, so that only its shell could be seen. Milton grabbed it and began to bite at it, but could not bite through it, because the turtle has just such a shell on its belly as it has on its back, and has only openings in front, at the back, and at the sides, where it puts forth its head, its legs, and its tail. I took the turtle away from Milton, and tried to see how its back was painted, and what kind of a shell it had, and how it hid itself. When you hold it in your hands and look between the shell, you can see something black and alive inside, as though in a cellar. I threw away the turtle and walked on, but Milton would not leave it, and carried it in his teeth behind me. Suddenly, Milton whimpered and dropped it. The turtle had put forth its foot inside of his mouth and had scratched it. That made him so angry that he began to bark. He grasped it once more and carried it behind me. I ordered Milton to throw it away, but he paid no attention to me. Then I took the turtle from him and threw it away. But he did not leave it. He hurriedly dug a hole near it. When the hole was dug, he threw the turtle into it and covered it up with dirt. The turtles live on land and in the water, like snakes and frogs. They breed their young from eggs. These eggs they lay on the ground, and they do not hatch them. But the eggs burst themselves, like fish spawn, and the turtles crawl out of them. There are small turtles, not larger than a saucer, and large ones, seven feet in length, and weighing seven hundred weights. The large turtles live in the sea. One turtle lays in the spring hundreds of eggs. The turtle's shells are its ribs. Men and other animals have each rib separate, while the turtle's ribs are all grown together into a shell. But the main thing is that with all the animals the ribs are inside the flesh, while the turtle has the ribs on the outside and the flesh beneath them. End of the Turtle by Count Lev and Tolstoy Read by Nemo